Okay, got it. For somebody. There we go. Let's put that because we won't need that necessary here. Okay. Um, so there are a few people here. Let's actually start with our case conference or case uh, presentation today. Um, I am uh, obviously Dr. Abbasi. Let's see how we can make it bigger here. Slideshow, yeah, right. Let's do the slideshow, okay. And uh, let's as well adjust it so we see the higher. Okay, better maybe, okay. So we are going to talk about the cervical surgeries. Obviously, there's a lot to be said about where, who does need cervical surgeries mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But um, obviously I, what I tell my patient, uh, Mike, is that our spine is made of bone and discs. And a disc is behaved like a tire of a car that cushion the car against the road. It cushion two bone against each other. And certain times is that you know that you have like a flat tire mm -hmm. And you have a small little hole. Many times what we do there, you just go trim what's pushing on the nerves. We call that the uh, decompression or discectomies. And um, depending on what part of the bone we take away, sometimes as well, we have different names for that. But sometimes the disc is completely uh, destroyed. In those cases, we not only take the pressure off the nerve, but as well, to make sure that, that non-functional disc is completely removed. And that um, can be done in two ways. We do, um, uh, for a long, long time, and we have good results with that, we do a fusion, meaning that we take the bad disc out, we put something that makes the bone grow. And just in the last 10, 15 years, we have something we call artificial disc mm -hmm. as well. So, but today we are just going to talk about the different approaches for cervical spine, for cervical meaning the neck, um, Let's start with the basic. How many cervical discs do we have? Seven. Wait. Uh -huh. You see that there? That was a trick. It How many was... cervical vertebrae do we have? Seven cervical vertebrae. Okay. Six cervical discs. Cervical discs, because there is between that, you know, C, um, no, there is not really much of a disc mm -hmm. between the C1 and C2. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and but let's uh, start in this endeavor. Uh, you know, obviously, you have to know the anatomy. Um, you see here two terms, and uh, welcome, Neil. Hey, how's it going? So, and if somebody has a question for us, Neil, please uh, uh, alert us, okay? Definitely. So, Are you going to share your screen? Here we see a lateral x-ray of the cervical spine. Mike, describe to me. What do you see? So I don't I think we see, see your screen, Dr. Abbas. Lateral x-ray, like you said. Um, I see some hardware posteriorly and anteriorly. Are we sharing this? Uh, probably we are not sharing this. That is <laughs> that's, better. That's the issue. Yeah. The reason, share this. Um, the reason that I did this, wanted to go on this topic actually was because I've um, been doing a lot of patient phone calls and I've seen some patients, mostly we do the ACDF here, um, but I have seen a couple of patients that get the PCDF and Obviously, I want to know the, the basics and everything like that, but I also want to know kind of the clinical reasoning for yeah. why to choose different approaches. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it. Describe first what you see. Yeah. So I see, let's see, it looks like C. Well, three. let's be the basics. This is a lateral mm -hmm. x-ray mm -hmm. of? Of the cervical spine. Of the cervical spine. And um, it looks like, obviously, this person has some very clear hardware um both anteriorly and posteriorly yeah yeah anterior meaning from the front posterior meaning from the back for people who don't know that but then you see the corner of the jaw mandible mm -hmm. right there then you see the back of the skull and then you see c1 c2 and c3 so, two, so, looks, four. so it looks like a c3 through six uh, three four five six, six. And then this is the seven. Mm -hmm. You don't see any screws in this mm -hmm. bone here. Why not? That's a good question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that. 
No, but let's, uh, in the back, you see screws in every single level, see three, four, five, and six. And uh, the front part, obviously we call that ACDF, the back part we call what? What's that PCDF stand for? Uh, posterior cervical decompression and fusion. And fusion. Now, uh, let's, we talked about decompression is when you take I, anything that pushes on the nerve, you take them away. We call that that's a definition of decompression. Mm -hmm. Nine out of ten time, it uh, sort of entails to remove the disc or bone. Mm -hmm. So the D in the ACDF is you achieve it by taking the disc away. But as well, if there are some osteophytes there, you can actually go in that narrow hole there and uh, bite. There's a tool we call that carison punch. It is like, look like it like has a small little foot and there's another piece on that and come and take a punch of it. And you can do, a, they remove a good amount of bone there as well. The decompression in the back of the neck, how would that be achieved? What do you think? So you would probably go in and remove part of the disc. Yeah. And put in maybe- From the back? From, or maybe from- uh, more of like a lateral approach. We haven't done in the last 78 years any discectomy, true discectomies from the back of the neck. The, if the disc herniation is very, very lateral, mm -hmm. you can go and remove the disc, but most of the time not. Why? Because the spinal cord is right in your way. And spinal cord, you see in the lumbar spine, we get away with pushing on the dura a lot because there is no spinal cord in the lumbar, mm -hmm. most of the lumbar spine. At the spinal cord ends, you know, when you're born, spinal cord and the dural sac are filling each other. But then when we grow, by the time we are like eight years, nine years old, our bone grow faster than our spinal cord. Mm -hmm. That means our spinal cord stops at L1, L2, L1, L2 which we call the uh -huh. conus medullaris. Yeah. And then we talked about that. And then the rest is um, the, the we can, the tail of a horse. Oh yeah, the caudo equina. Yeah. So, and those are peripheral nerves actually. Mm -hmm. So they're very resilient. You can push on them. So in the lumbar spine, you can put pressure, but one of the wrong answer in my board, neurosurgery board is putting in thoracic or cervical spine, retracting the mm -hmm. spinal cord because we've learned it the hard way. We don't tolerate it well. So no real big discectomy from the back, but. Um, now, if I push you against the wall, and uh, I'm the disc, and push you against the wall, I can. You can take me away. That would be a discectomy, or I can take the wall away. I'm still pushing you. Mm -hmm. I can take the wall away. What is the back of so, the? So, like almost like a laminectomy. Laminectomy. Then? Laminectomy would be a, a what? How you achieve decompression on the posterior um, cervical fusions? Okay. Now, uh, this patient got them both. What do you call them? If somebody get the anterior and posterior fusion, mm. it's a very simple, trivial a, thing. A full fusion? Yeah, we call it 360. Okay. Yeah, 360, front and back. Okay, so um, do you see those little, almost like a lines, black, uh, dark, uh, or well, in the uh, x rays, white mm. lines? What are they? I would think that there's some sort of um, space or like a pin. The pin? Why why would we put pin right where the disc is? To um, kind of maintain that space and then that can aid the bone growth around it. The pin is not to maintain the disc space. The, the cage, that piece of material that we put in, but that is in here is a, a, it's a plastic material we call PEEK, P-E-E-K, polyethyl, ethyl, something, something. And, the pin is so we see where that cage is because otherwise it would be a plastic you wouldn't see. That the white pins are integrated inside of the disc just so you see where the okay. discs are. So it's okay? just a marker. The marker. So you know if you are too far in, you mm -hmm. see it because you wouldn't see it with a regular. So it's a marker to know where your cages are okay. inside of the cage, which is plastic. Why Why do they use plastic cages? Because I know for our Olaf, we use metal cages. Yeah. So um, for a long time, you know, when I started uh, my med school, we would use only metal cages, mm -hmm. titanium. 
patient had some reaction to that because of the impurities. Mm -hmm. But then we figured it out later on. But then it was a huge move in the late 1990s and 2000. We found this plastic peak, EK peak, mm -hmm. we call it. Mm -hmm. It has identical characteristic to human bone. So meaning that, you know, we thought that behaves like a bone. So it's a good thing to put in. And then about 10 years ago, we noticed that um, when we put it in, our body deal with that. It build the films around it. It never becomes part of our body. Mm. So literally 10 years after you put a peak cage in, you can go pick it up. And then we noticed at the same time, we had lots of experience with the um, titanium. We noticed that ti pure titanium, our body loves it. And uh, our cells go in and literally our bone grows into the, the, the titanium. And so that becomes part of mm -hmm. the fusion. So our bone grows much faster if you put titanium in. And it also has to do with the size of the pores. You know, our oste what, we, what do we call the bone cell that make the bone grow? Osteoblasts. They are like cats. If it fits, it sits. <laughs> so if you have pores that are... 193 uh, the, um, plus minus uh, 3.6 micron, mm -hmm. that is the ideal size for the osteoblast get. And if the osteoblasts get in, they, if they fit, they sit. Yeah. So, um, and now for cervical spine, still lots of people use peak. I use peak, um, but I put a cage uh, as well. A part of the, the plate is titanium that I put in that place. But overall, um, I think we started with titanium, we went to peak, and now most of us are coming back to it. This is a science in development. We learn every day from it. Is there anything else you can see in this picture you want to describe to us what you see? Let's talk a little about reading this, okay? Not just the neck. Describe everything you see here. And Neil, um, you can as well p uh, 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 chime in. What are the other things you see here? I was going to say strongest bone in our body. What's the strongest bone in our body? You don't hear oh, the Can you guys hear me? You? No, you, you should be able to you see got, what's the whitest thing me? part there, right? Uh, yeah, the well, skull. <laughs> well, no, no, but part of the skull. What is the part of the skull that is the strongest bone in actually in our body? The name in Latin actually it is very impressive is massive, something called like, it's a massive bone, mastoid. Oh, okay. Okay, do you see the mastoid? I do see it. Okay, yeah, point I to just... it, take the, take the thing and point to it. Yeah, I mean, you see how massive it is. X-ray has trouble to go through it. Now- It's even stronger than the femur? Oh, way stronger than wow. femur. Way stronger than femur. Mastoid or the name says- Yeah. I didn't even, I didn't know that. I yeah. thought the femur was, was the strongest bone in the body. So, Dr. Abbasi, let's I was wondering, can you hear more me? Here, okay. You see the, uh, this, this bone, what's this bone? Um, the mandible. Mandible. Um, how old is this patient? You see the, the smooth edge and some of the here, you don't see any teeth here. Yeah, so they've lost their wisdom teeth. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, what else do you see? You know, like, um, do you see in this picture, uh, like back here, all of a sudden, uh, there is a little bit of a darker area here. So is that the, a little bit of brain atrophy? No, 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 you wouldn't see anything like that. You see that there and you see some here, you see some here. Some sinuses maybe. Sinuses, yeah, in the back. And here is probably the area that, you know, that, that the sinuses are, the, the blood-filled sinus, and these are the air-filled sinuses are. That is where it is, you know, that you hear practically the, uh, the sphenoid sinus is somewhere here and the mastoid sinus and the, the, the air cells, the mastoid air cells are back here. Now, um, let's go to the next picture, okay? Let's see what else we can see. We have a lot to cover. So these are just a couple. I wanted to have a slide so we could talk to just some of the indications for why we'd perform the surgery in the first place. You kind yeah. of talked about nerve compression but yeah so and if there is just a compression of the nerve which give you push on the nerve that goes out of the spine they give you symptoms along that nerve mm -hmm. and those nerves if they're pushed we call that radiculopathy mm -hmm. 
Do you want to go? Let's go over that the radical opacity. Like, um, dark side. This we call that C six. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. Eight. Seven is actually middle finger and half of this one, and eight is this one. Now we have seven vertical, um, spine, mm -hmm. but the nerve between the C seven and T one is not called T one. It's called C eight. Yeah. And that for that reason, C six that in the cervical spine, nerves go what? Above or below the same number uh, above. vertebra? Above. above. C, uh, C7 goes between C6 and 7, because C8 is below C7. In the thoracic and lumbar spine, it's the other way, that L5 goes between L5 and S1. So in the thoracic and lumbar spine, the the same nerve goes below the same number vertebrae and the cervical spine goes above the same number vertebrae. Don't ask me why, it is just what it is. I remember learning this in uh, my MSK class yeah. way back when, and I remember struggling to wrap my head around it. But, but at, least, at least once you understand that, you understand why, but, but it, it gets even more complicated. You know, in the cervical spine, like C6, 7 will give you usually what kind of symptoms? C7 radiculopathy, mm -hmm. okay? C67 will give you C6, uh, C, C7 most of the time, radiculopathy. But L5, S1, this herniation, or let's say L4, 5. L4, 5, what nerve is going out between L4, 5? L4. Then, four. L4. Yes, yeah, L4, yeah, yeah. L4. Below the same number vertebrae. So L4, 5, L4 is going out of the foramen. But L4, 5, 80% of the time will give you L5 symptoms. Hmm. Nature is crazy. Why? Because 80% of the disc herniation is not foraminal, where the nerve is going out. It is in the lateral recess. Hmm. Let's see if we have a picture that we can find it here. I don't know. I want to show you here. Let's find here. So this imagine here in the cervical spine. It is different because there is cord. The entire lateral recess is covered with cord. So you get, if you push on the nerve to give you radiculopathy, it's going to push on the same number. But in the lumbar spine, because you have quina and the nerves are just trickling down, most of your time you get the symptom of the lateral recess stenosis, which is not the nerve that goes out in that level, but the nerve that goes on one level below it. So the traversing. So if you understand that you're ahead of 80% of the whole doctors in the whole world <laughs> to understand that first of all, the nerve that goes in the neck is above the same number of vertebrae. Mm -hmm. In the thoracic and lumbar spine is below that, but still in the lumbar spine, you don't get the uh, symptom of that nerve that goes out that level. You get the symptoms of the nerve that is level below it, 80%. If you have a disc herniation in L4-5, 80% of the time you have L5, right? L5 radiculopathy. Even though it should, it seems like it would be. If it was foraminal, extra foraminal, you would have L4 yeah. with symptoms. But if you understand that, and then somebody comes with L5 radiculopathy. Now you know where to look. 80% of the yeah. time you look for L4-5. Mm -hmm. And that, just that understanding, if you don't take anything from this episode, just take that away, that um, in the lumbar spine, you look uh, for the symptoms of the lateral recess for the level below, even though in the L5-S1, um, literally L5 goes out through L5-S1, mm -hmm. but you still, most of the time, you have L4-5 symptoms, okay? So let's go back here and uh, go a little, uh, talk a little more about the, now yeah. here, this here. Um, Neil, I'm not sure if you can join us or not, but you are welcome to join us. And I was wondering if you could hear me. I don't think you could hear me earlier. Can you hear me, Dr. Abbasi? Let me see if we have anything. No, it's not us. Uh, let me see here. Uh, let's see here. Maybe, maybe it is us. I don't know. Oh, yeah, it is us. Let's see if we can change that to see... Uh, We have just few of that. Let's try all of them, see which one it is, or maybe it is just. Um, Can you guys hear us? Well, you know, I guess let, as long as people hear us, 
We should uh, just continue. Yeah, it looks like Neil's giving us the thumbs up. So people okay. are hearing so us. So people are hearing us. Okay. So we will uh, troubleshoot this later. So I guess the whole last, uh, the whole thing is on your shoulder, Mike. That's okay. Describe this. What do you see here? Okay. So I'm seeing a lateral view. The imaging modality looks to me like an MRI. Yes, it is. Um, MRI of? The cervical spine. In? T2, T2 sequence. I, yeah, I need to work on the T1. The sagittal T2 sequence. Yep. Okay, so this is MRI of the cervical spine in the sagittal T2 sequence. Mm -hmm. That is what how you describe it, how you start it. So describe things that for sure you see. So I can definitely see. point to it here. Take that and point to it. So I can definitely see it right here. Start with a little bit. Start so. with you know overall overview. Okay, so now that is one of the mistakes that most of people do. They start with the most difficult part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Start with easy part of the picture to orient yourself. Like, where's the skin of the back of the neck? So I see the skin of the back of the neck here. Where's the skin of the front of the neck? Right here. No, you don't see it. Okay. <laughs> okay, because you have such an yes. artifact okay. there. Okay. Yeah, I see um, the, the the chin. I see the mm -hmm. chin. See the MRI again. If you if we if you know how this is produced, you understand why you have a shadow right there, like coming from top to bottom. Because there's air and and. No, like, not because of there. Because no. you're concentrating the your uh, magnetic gradient for the spine. This is the not the neck MRI. Mm -hmm. This is a spine MRI. So to make it the resolution bigger in the spine, they're concentrating uh -huh. that gradient on the spine. Okay, so if it was neck MRI, they would widen that gradient, but then you wouldn't get a good resolution of the intracanal uh, pathology. So, but describe it. You see the skin of the neck in the back. You see the you um, see the brain. I see. Yep, I see the brain. I see some of the cerebellum right here. What do you call those uh, whole, those lines? Uh, the arbor. folia, cerebellar folia. I was gonna call the arbor vitae. Yeah, you can call it that way, but you see the 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 folias. Okay. In the what part of the brain do you see? This is the cerebellum. That's the cerebellum. What part of the cerebrum do you see? I see the occipital lobe. Mostly. You see the occipital lobe. What is between the occipital lobe and cerebellum? Uh, There's a tent. Uh, the tentorium. Tentorium. Yeah. Tentorium. Yes. Yeah. So, and what is in the corner of the cerebrum and cere cerebellum? What big vessel is there? In the corner of the... What separates... What vessel is... Big vessel is between cerebrum and cerebellum? Transverse sinus. Okay. That is where the blood comes to go to the jugular vein. Okay? I need to do so, some anatomy review. Well, we will do it together. <laughs> so uh, go more. And Describe I what some, else you some see. Some more skin of yes. the scalp, the posterior scalp right here. Okay, let's go with, let's be even more. If you are going to do that, let's do it right. Obviously, this is skin. What is the dark line under the skin? What is that? Is that some subcutaneous tissue? Yes, yeah, subcutaneous what? Fat. Fat. Okay. And then... This is, but then, then you have the cortical bone. So mm -hmm. you see, this is the skin and very, very white there is the subcutaneous fat. Mm -hmm. And then you have the dark line. The dark line, again, if you know how the images are produced, these are proton, you see proton. Mm -hmm. What has in our skull that is everywhere in our skull has very little proton, the cortical bone. Okay, and then you see the, Spongiosa in the bone, and then you see again dark. So our skull is made of cortical bone, spongiosa, cortical bone. Okay, and then underneath is dura and some, but you don't see that except if it's thickened or is a problem with that. And then you see the gyri mm -hmm. and sulci mm -hmm. of the brain, pentorium, transverse sinus that eventually turns around becomes the sigmoid sinus. Then you see the cerebellum, and then you see. Here's uh, what is that? So the pons. Well, you get to the pons. No, no, we are not by pons yet. We have this triangular white things right here. I know that that's just some white connect, like white matter. That's kind of no. It's not white matter. What is it? It is a fourth ventricle. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, it's a fourth ventricle right there. And then you have the, the aqueduct that spills the CSF out. And then you have this very, very important structure right here. The medulla. medulla this is the medulla oblongata. And, and then the here's the pons and so on. And in front of the pons, above it, you have the midbrain, mm -hmm. back of the tongue. And then here you have some, uh, I'm sorry, the nose. Here's the nose. Here's the tongue is here. And then here is the big air filled, no, no white, no proton because it's air. Uh -huh. It's a sphenoid sinus. And you see all the major vessels there, the basilar and so on. They're all there. And the mid uh, uh, cerebral, you know, the uh, middle cerebral arteries and so on. And then you have this structure here. What is that? If you go a little to the side, you see that this is like, like an indentation goes right up. Is, the, is that the first? Oh, don't it. Oh, yeah. C, so, oh, so that's right. C2. That is C2. Now, C1, there is really no disc. Yeah. There is a ring. Yes. And in front of the ring, the odontoid goes up. Yep. And it's very secured with lots of strong ligaments. Mm -hmm. And it enables us to move our head from side to side. That is most of the time what it does, OK? And then you have the first disc, which is the C2, C3 disc. Now go ahead and describe the pathology that you see. So um, I see that. This is C2, C3. So I see C3, C4. It looks a little bit narrow. But first, let me describe how normal should look like. Look at the C2, 3. You see the disc. Mm -hmm. You see white, mm -hmm. which is CSF. Mm -hmm. Then you see dark, which is the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Then you see a little more white, which is again CSF from front to back. Yep. Disc, CSF, spinal cord, CSF, bone, mm -hmm. right? And in the volume, in the area, one third of the canal is occupied with the spinal cord. Two thirds of it is actually fluid. That is why you get away with moving your neck around. And now you get to see three, four. Describe what you see. So then I see the disc protruding mm -hmm. up into the spinal cord because there's not that nice space. That but as well, if you look carefully, the back of the bones are not aligned. The back of the bone is shifting a little back. Do you see that there? Mm -hmm. Point to the back of the C4 bone. Yes. And back of the C3 bone. Yeah. You see, they are not aligned. There's but what do we call that? That's some lysthesis there. Spondylolisthesis. And if it's going backward, we call that? Retrolysthesis. Retrolysthesis. If it's going forward, we call that? Anterolysthesis. Anterolysthesis. But that is not the whole problem. And that's why this patient is not in a good shape. Mm -hmm. Look at in the back, there is an indentation in yeah. the back of the spine as well. What yeah. is that? That's a good question. <laughs> a, at that level in the midline is the ligamentum flavon hypertrophy. Okay. So, okay. so then they have some spinal stenosis in that region. Based on the disc herniation, spondylolisthesis, and, and ligamentum flavon hypertrophy. hypertrophy. Okay. Now, um, then describe the rest of it. What do you see? <laughs> So then I go down to the next level. So now we're on C uh, four five. Similar. And it's similar. C um, five six similar. Yep. C six seven similar in the front, but now all of a sudden you have opening in the back. You see that there? I do. Okay. So even though it's something in the front is pushing on it, it's not pushing against anything in the back. The wall. Okay. The so wall. the stenosis. What levels are stenotic? What levels would you call them are stenotic? Uh, C, I'd say C3 through about C5. Mm -hmm. What about C5? C5, 6? How does it look like there? Sorry, I'm doing some counting, keeping the numbers straight yeah. right now. Definitely, that's five, a 3, six. 4, 5. Yep. I would say C3 to C6. Okay. Okay, there's stenotic. Now, this is not the best picture, but in a better picture, you could even see if there's a damage inside of the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. um, how would you see if there's damage inside of the spinal cord in this picture, if it was? Uh, and this is like very fuzzy, but sometimes you get good picture. 
would it be if there was more white on the inside of the and, spinal and why? Why would it be white inside of the spinal cord and spinal canal if, was, if it was damaged? Because if there's like infl inflammation and it draws fluid to that area. Same reason. If you, I hit you really hard, it swells up mm -hmm. because your tissue, your water in your body comes in to damage it. More water, mm -hmm. more proton. And again, People, if you really want to understand, not just mimic it, understand how these images are produced. We should do a, a physics of MRI. Mm -hmm. So once you understand uh, why the picture look, what how they look like, you have a basic understanding and then you can deduct things, many things you can deduct from that. So let's say this picture, now uh, I am that, pa I'm this patient and you are the doctor. Um, what are you looking at? You examine me. Tell me what exam do you want to have? And I know, I think I remember this patient and I tell you what the exam is. So how do you examine me? So first I'd, I'd want to do a little inspection, look at the range of motion of the neck and see if that can reproduce any of their symptoms. I do some spurling. Uh, yes, it does. Spurling? How do you do spurling? We do a spurling. So, how do you do that? I'd have you turn and kind of just axial load on your head. And then... No, just you, you put put the hand on one side, you ask them push against it. Okay. So, and if it, that produce pain, especially radiculopathy, that's the spurling test. Okay. And then, um, so yes, uh, spurling is positive. The patient has, I have neck pain. I have radiculopathy almost everywhere. Uh -huh. And mo most of the, the, the head and so on, I have radicul radiculopathy. And so I'd start looking at um, their grip strength. I look at you know the grip is weak. Yeah, mostly distal is weaker than the. Uh, and then what? What? What else do you look for? Especially with this finding here, so it's significant narrowing in the cervical spine. I'd be worried about some myelopathy, so I'd look. At yes, the patients. Hoffman sign. Hoffman is positive. I'd check patients their, hyperreflectic. Yeah, reflexes. Um, so proprioception in the lower extremities diminished, mm -hmm. which is a sign of myelopathy. Okay. okay. So, um, so what what else do you want to know? Sensation. Sensation. Patient has sensory deficit and radiculopathy. Most of the um, cervical spine. If it's been progressing quickly, slow. Very important. Very important. If it's progressive, that becomes more or less of a urgent matter. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is progressive. Okay. So what do we do? So well, you know, based on this picture and then based on that physical exam finding. I'd probably be calling you pretty quickly. Yeah, sounds good to me. Now, and um, so this I, is the this is the post. Is it no? This is a different no, 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 patient. No, that, I didn't. Yeah, I couldn't find the post-op patients, but I want to yeah. go back to the one that um, that we just had up. This one? No, no, no. The the one we were talking about with the Here? This patient. Yeah. So they ended up proceeding to get a PCDF, and so my posterior cervical, posterior cervical. Yep. And I was curious mm -hmm. why. When to do the front, when to do the back, yes. and so on and so forth. Now, um, if something is globally narrow and one segment or two segment, ACDF is a beautiful surgery because you go to that segment, you don't stabilize much, and every surgery in the front, um, we get to it actually in much more delicate way. We go through through the between the muscle, between the anatomy. We don't cut much muscle. We get there, we get to the bad disc, we take the bad disc out. We can't even go in that narrow uh, the gap there with the microscope. I do it with the microscope and open up the space and so on and, and take the pressure off. But do you remember that we talked about here, there's significant amount of pressure from the back as well. Mm -hmm. You cannot get to the pressure from the back. And in the, the in the, this patient, is if it's my patient, I, if the patient is a young patient that's going to have lots of activities, I go front and back. But if the patient is sick, if the patient has lots of limitation, and I want to do a fast surgery, I usually go from the back because in the back, there's no question. I cut the lamina and I open up that space. Mm -hmm. I, uh, if you can do better opening of the spine from the back than from the front to do the same amount of opening from the front, you have to take the entire bone off. Mm -hmm. You do have what we call corpectomy. That is a massive surgery. Whereas in the back, you can just go and cut the lamina, everything is open. Yeah. Doing it from the front, you have to literally take the whole bone off, drill on the bone. That is a massive surgery.
Okay. Dr. Avasi, so, I was oh. wondering, do you have a minimally invasive approach for cervical spine? ACDF is a minimally invasive approach for the cervical spine from the front. And uh, doing uh, AC, ACDF is a very elegant surgery. But if you have so much problem from the back pushing on the spine, and if you have myelopathy, in the ACDF, you get just to the spine at the level of the disc. But if there is still significant narrowing all along, the only way to remove that from the front is doing a corpectomy. Then you don't have get any benefit of the ACDF. Then I prefer to go from the back because I want to... Uh, 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 A better visualization? Yeah. No, well, not only visualization. You get the decompression of the entire spine. Whereas in the ACDF, if the material of the disc is mostly what push on the nerve, ACDF is a very elegant surgery. Mm. Now, these are advanced kind of courses. You know, this is something that I discuss with uh, people who have been doing this uh, surgery for 10 years about advantage of one versus another. But generally, if the disc is pushing on the nerve, ACDF is beautiful. If everything is pushing on the nerve, you still can do ACDF. But the better way of taking yeah. the pressure off is cutting the lamina out. Now, why don't we do always cutting the lamina out? Because yes. then you have to cut the muscle, cut the bone, the higher risk of infection, the posterior cervical, they have like 10 times, 20 times more risk of infection than anterior cervicals. Mm -hmm. It's extremely rare to get the infection for an anterior cervical. After practicing for 23 years, I had my first anterior cervical infection. I, yeah. And you are the lucky man to see it. I, yes. Yeah? yeah. So, but posterior yeah. cervical, it, the rate of infection is like tremendously higher, okay? Dr. Abbasi, I wanted to introduce you to Lucas. He's a second year medical student at my school Excellent. and he's aspiring for neurosurgery. Wonderful. He just asked the question, yes, are you please. able to reach T2 with ACDF approach? Plus I thought you could maybe induce more kyphosis with the PCDF cage placement than you could with the ACDF. Actually, you can produce, introduce uh, kyphosis um, you mean lordosis, cervical, you can restore the cervical lordosis better with ACDF because then you can put a cage in that is bigger in the front than the back. We call that lordotic cage or physiologic cage or anatomic cage. Um, so the ACDF is actually better to restore the normal cervical lordosis. And there was another question you asked about that. Can you get to the T1, T2? In Can you get neck, to a T2 with the ACDF approach? In, in your neck, I probably could. In, in my neck? People, <laughs> you got skinny, long yeah. neck, you can, hmm. in some people. But um, most of the time, the C7, T1 is the lowest you can get because then you come under the jugular uh -huh. region and then becomes harder to get there. Um, many times, if you go to T2, it is not because we want to decompress there, but because in the T1, T2, you put bigger screws in the pedicle screws rather than lateral mass screws. Let's look, look at them and talk about it, okay? Let's move forward. We, we will come back to that, okay? This is a very good question, by the way. So this is a different patient, obviously. And then the, here we see that this patient got a 360 as well. How do I know that? I see the, the remnant of the cage. I see the bone is growing in the front. I see as well some screws in the back. And here you see this is a posterior screw going into this structure. And this structure we call lateral mass. So in most of the cervical spine, we do so-called lateral mass fusion. The lateral mass is practically overgrown facade. And the transverse process, they grow to a big chunk. And that big chunk is what we use to put a screw in. You see the screws from the ACDF that goes into the vertebral body. Here you see two mm -hmm. screws. Sometimes we put two, sometimes we put one. And here you don't see the screw on the other side. Why not? If you just get a different cut, yeah, it's the just... next screw, the screw here is probably in the next cut yeah. and not the, at the level. So it doesn't mean anything is wrong there. It just means you didn't catch the screw at mm -hmm. that cut. Okay. Um, posterior cervical fusions are, um, it, no, it's faster, much, much faster to do a five-level posterior cervical than a five-level ACDF. Mm -hmm. Because in ACDF, every level you have to go there, go into the side of the gap, take the disc out. So 
Um, no, five levels and the ACDF is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But five level posterior cervical, you can do it much faster, much more efficient, but you have to cut the muscle in yeah. the back, you have a high risk of infection and so on. So you have, it's a give and take. And sometimes you have to do them both, especially uh, uh, when patient uh, have soft bone, mm -hmm. you have to like uh, brace them from front and the back. That oh, would yeah. be the 360. Now let's go to this picture. This picture um, shows you the ACDF. Now describe what you see here. What do you see? So again, I think that this is a, well, this might, is this a CT or is this an MRI? Mm -hmm. This you is tell a CT. Me. I want to say that this is a CT. Yes, it's a CT. Because when I look at the brain. But why is CSF white in the CT? Neil, you want to tell us why this CSF in this CT is white? Because CSF should be black in the CT. Contrast. Yes. What do we call if you put CSF uh, in the contrast in the CSF? A myelogram. A myelogram. A myelogram. This is a, describe this. What is this picture? Okay. So this is a sagittal view of a myelogram so of the cervical region. It's a post myelogram CT of the cervical spine in the sagittal and coronal view. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me, what do we see? So I see, let's see. So we're in the cervical region. I can see some, this must have been a larger patient because I can see some of their. Yeah, it's a larger patient. That. It's a larger patient. Okay. Um, I'll give that to you. Two, three, four. I think we're on C. What are those lines here? Black lines here and this fuzzy stuff. Is that artifact? Yeah. Off. Artifact off. Mm. Oh, is that, does that have to do oh, with the, the contrast? Hospital? No, right. the contrast, why would the contrast just give us artifact here, it, but not the, somewhere else? Because it's all at the level of the hardware. It is off the level of hardware, but look at that hardware as well here. You don't see that there. Mm -hmm. You just see it here. And Don here. says maybe the screws. Uh, the screws, no, you have as well screw here. There's a screw here. You don't see that there. So let's, this is a CT, right? What is the difference between the CT uh, in the CT between the titanium and stainless steel. Stainless steel is much denser. Hmm. It gives you metal artifact. That is why we use titanium. It is a uh, less dense. It's as strong as stainless steel, but it doesn't give you the artifact. So this is the artifact of the pin inside of the cage. Hmm. And you see that here in both things, it goes across where those, uh, uh, don't ask me why it's not here because this and this are too close to each other. But either way, these are the metallic artifact from the pins inside of the cage. So you see Would that- you say that the titanium is this provides the same strength, but it is less dense? And doesn't give you the artifact for that reason, because it's less dense. It's lighter. That's why they built those heavy stealth, those expensive stealth thing from titanium Mm. It's stronger than stainless steel, stronger than aluminum, uh, less weight. That is why they built very, very expensive airplanes from titanium. Mm. Okay. So what else do you see? So I see that the hardware is there. It, for the most part, it looks intact. It's, it's hard to tell somewhat because of the artifact. Um, which makes it harder to tell if there's a halo. So if you would, you know, attend one of our, where we talked about the physic of the CT, mm -hmm. you would know if you really want to have an answer in the CT, look at the, the axial pictures. Mm -hmm. Neil, do you remember why axial is the best picture to look at actual picture versus sagittal and uh, coronal? All I'm remembering is the voxels you were talking about. <laughs> Yeah, the actual pictures in the CT is the zagit, uh, axial. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is the actual picture. The zagittal and right. the coronal are reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So, as a matter of fact, they take this um, axial picture, they stack them, and then they build this coronal and zagittal. In reality, that's pixelated like your steps and so on. The computer just make it smooth for yeah. you and create picture uh, information that's not really real how accurate that's, is the reconstruction 
from taking the axial and to making the other views. So the, then that again, if you, we talked about that in a regular CT, those thickness of those layers are 2.5 millimeter, okay? And the high density is 1.25. So imagine these are actually slides, the slices that are 2.5 millimeters. So in one centimeter, there are four of them. In one inch, there are like 10 of them. The reason it's smooth is because computer making, excuse my French, is makes shit up. That is why you see the, the, the artifact like that. If there's a question, always go to the original picture, which is the axial. axial. So again, that is when it, things start making sense. Yeah. So um, you have to correlate things with the axial to really understand them better, okay? So meaning that, uh, uh, yes, it's a fusion there. The fusion is okay. But if any question about the screws, screw position, loosening of the screws, look at the axial, okay? What else do you see? Describe what else do you see? Especially, you know, what is here? The lungs. What is here? Is that, that's the heart. Mm. Part, part of the, the pulmonary. Aorta. Okay, yeah. Here, aorta. Here, yeah. this is heart. Okay. This is top of the heart and so on, this okay. aorta. And then the, the, uh, the first rib, yeah. probably, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the paraspinal muscle, sternocleidomastoid, fat there, and so on. Um, this is the clivus. This is the rest of the skull. And uh, here you see the odontoid, yeah. the arch, anterior arch of the C1. Mm -hmm. Is this anterior arch of the C1 growing to odontoid? No, is it? No. Well, you don't know. I don't think so. Well, there are two things you can do to find out. You get, again, go watch our original video that we had made for physics of CT. Mm -hmm. You can change the Hongsville unit, windowing it to concentrate wow. on that segment. Then you see if there's a gap there or not. Or even better, do that with the original with picture. The axial view. But because that is, uh, it does, it, this is mostly made up by yeah. computer, so it yeah. appears better to your eyes, okay? So the this is the one. So we, in medicine and radiology, we invented those um, Instagram filters that somebody looks like a model. In reality, they look like a potato. <laughs> so this is what we have been doing for 50 years with these pictures. It looked beautiful picture, but in reality, the original of this act as uh, sagittal and chronal look like a sack of potato, okay? But the original picture is the axial. These are just stacked and just made beautiful for your eyes. Lots of information that, that doesn't really exist. It averaged. So let's go to the next, okay? So we are almost getting toward the end of thing. We want to go through this. So this is a one single level ACDF. Beautiful surgery. Beautiful in the sense of patient do well. 95% of them improve. We can do it as a day surgery. They go home same day. Um, a small incision in the front of the neck, we put it in a fold of the skin. We push the muscle to one side, vessels to the lateral, esophagus and the trachea to the, the medial side. You will see one of them very soon. Oh, yeah. And then we go to the front of the disc. Our eye as a neurosurgeon use a microscope mm -hmm. and I zoom it in. It looked like a huge cliff and in reality is a tiny, tiny gap. In that tiny gap, we take the bad disc out, we take the pressure off, we go look at the spinal cord, we bite the osteophyte. It's a very elegant surgery. And we do all of that in a one hour, patient go home, same day, latest next day. 93% of the patient do fantastic. That's a huge number for spine, okay? Show me what else do you see in that picture. Impress me with the information that you just learned in the 15, last 15 minutes. Okay, so this is... Uh sagittal CT view of the uh, cervical spine. And the CSF is not white here. So it's not a myelogram. It's not a myelogram, regular CT. Yep. Okay. Regular CT. Um, and this patient is status post ACDF C6, C7. Okay. Um, 
I can't get a really good view of the hardware here because it is the sagittal view. So I could switch the axis. No, you, you and you can change the window. You can go back and forth. You can always you look at. You never look at the recon, reconstruction views alone. As as far as I can see, C six and C seven look pretty well aligned here. Yes, it is. And when I follow when I follow this all the way down, I don't really see a lot of stenosis. Um, that's very clear. That jumps out at me. Of course, it would be easier to see if there was contrast, but yeah, we didn't do a myelogram because we weren't concerned at this point. This patient has a tumor in his tongue. Look okay. at the tongue. Where's the tongue? Show here, me the tongue. Here. Neil, do you see the tongue? Does patient has a tumor in his tongue? What is that in the tongue? Inside of the tongue? What is um, it? I guess. Is that a tongue ring? What? Is that, is that a, a piercing of the tongue? Uh, my thought is maybe they have a cavity and they got a, a metal filling. Oh, yeah. Lucas said dental implants. Mm, well, not implants. It's just a just a, uh, the the old, uh, old old way, you know, that amalgam uh, in the teeth filling of the tooth. And again, oh, filling okay. in the tooth because the actual, that is exactly what we go back to the physics of it. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. pictures are made horizontal in the face. So meaning that the amalgam of the tooth will have like spikes going in all yeah. direction. Yeah. So it will make that artifact everywhere and if you look at that, uh, you see that the spikes exactly correspond where the reading of that uh, X-ray was that when it was produced. Again, uh, we made a video about that. If you understand the physics of it, you understand why that yeah. thing there is an artifact and all, uh, that's all what it is. And why this artifact is where the tongue is, even though the, uh, the yeah. tooth filling is to the side of it. Yep. Why do you have it there? Because we're looking at it like that, but well, we're not looking at it. It was recreated from, from a slices. picture that was this way, and yeah. that tooth filling makes spikes in all direction, yeah. and this is the reconstruction from that original picture. What is that? Almost snake in patient's neck. What is this? <laughs> That's the esophagus. Larynx and esophagus. Yeah. What is this? Hyoid bone. Hyoid bone in in what percentage of the people that is a bone in one percent of the patient patient is a just cartilage? I have no idea. Yeah, in most of the patient actually it's a cartilage. Really, it's not that pronounced. Okay, the hyoid bone. That's exactly what it is. Doctor Abbasin. Yes. Um, some students were wondering: Is there any sort of materials or resources you recommend them to read up on before coming live on? your channel or just to learn more about spine any certain textbooks or things well, like that you know um no no actually you know we have a lot of previous uh the, um meeting the educational thing you no know, what i really really recommend obviously attend ask question and watch many of those previous ones you may not get all the information from one meeting, but then you notice lots of things repeat themselves. Like yeah. we talked about the metal artifact like mm -hmm. 20 times. Yeah, but trial and error, that's right. After you watch them the eight times, then you mm. it just sits in, you know, or uh, I made a TikTok about the, how we learn things. When you start learning things, you are like a sieve, like a net. The, the, uh, the element in your net is big. Lots of information passed through without getting caught. Every time you learn more, you're reducing the size of those uh, that the web mm -hmm. in your net of brain where you catch the information. Eventually, you catch enough information and your size of your net, the, the cells become so small, then you catch more and more information, okay? So just Keep attending. It's about repetition and so on. Like, tell them to tell them to come on to live with us because then you really feel like you're in the hot seat and you yeah. get really right. motivated to learn. Yeah. What is that bone here? Is that just part of the clavicle, or is that one of the ribs? That uh, in the front. Hey, Neil, what Ron is that? Says, is that the sternum? Sternum. Yeah, it's a sternum. Ah, okay. 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 I'm going to make it really fancy now. What is the name of that bone right there? Is that sphenoid? No, oh, that's not nope. sphenoid. That the sphenoid sinus is right there. That's higher up. Yeah. 
you're getting close. It, if you go to the side of it, then you have the sphenoid wing, but it's clivus. It's called clivus. Clivus. Okay. Yeah, it's one of it probably second hardest bone in our body. I just had a case I published about the patient in South Africa who got a knife right through the eye, through the sphenoid sinus. And what stopped the knife was the clivus. And it was just about less than a centimeter, about half a centimeter through the clivus, stopping right at the basilar artery. Wow. If you haven't seen that, go watch that thing in my Facebook and so on. Uh, I have an album about that. Should we watch it? Sure. Did you see it? Okay. Right, right now. Well, how will we say it? We only have five minutes left. Okay. So now let's do it another time then. Okay. Did you let's... say the clivus was an extension of the sphenoid wing? No, it's not an extension of. It's a different bone. Okay. But it's a very hard bone. So here we have two, three, four, five, six, seven, T1, T2, mm -hmm. this herniation. And you ask how far can you go down? This is a skinny neck. Look at that. It, you can get a you can get an X-ray and you see you can access that anteriorly. So if you can if you can do the surgery efficiently and safely from the front, always do it from the front. People heal so much faster. Risk of infection is lower, lower. but uh, in this case, you could. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this a T2 MRI? Because I see the CSF is bright white. It's enhanced. Correct. This is C2 MRI. And uh, it's not a CT uh, because look at that in the CT, mm -hmm. most of the time, not most of them, all the time, fat is dark. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here, fat is white. That's a T2. Um, because CSF is white and fat is white, and the CT never make the fat white. Okay. Lucas it says it seems like there's zero lordosis here. That's correct. Yeah. Good observation. Good observation. Many people who are in pain, the muscle make the spine straight. You lose the normal cervical lordosis. Okay. Is there I a name another, for that? Is there is what you call like straight? Reversal. It's called, it's called reversal of cervical lordosis. Okay. So I have a meeting in a few minutes. So let's. I think we have two more to go. I said put this one in because it's oh, pretty. That's a good one. I remember this one. I remember this one because I did the double plating on that. We yeah. are not going to be able to go to bottom of it. I did not want to do anterior and posterior. Usually you should. Mm -hmm. Patient has a, a spontaneous ankylosis of uh, some of the bone here. Mm -hmm. And this is the bad disc, the hypermobile pushing the things. Yeah. For some other reason, especially because patient was very, they had lots of comorbidity. I did the double plating. If you know which one it is, we should one day just talk about this case. Mm -hmm and double plating because I want to stabilize it. We don't need to go back and do another uh, three hour surgery. Yeah. Okay. So, and the last picture. Okay. What do you want to talk about this one? The so um, ACDF yeah. and the bones that, beautifully growing. I liked that it gave, I liked the multiple views. I yeah. thought that was helpful. One, Dr. Abbasi, there was a comment um, and so another student said, it's a good question. How does this impact the patient's airway? It seems that they're almost closed off in the MRI from the previous slide. This previous MRI, you mean this, this one? one? Here? Yes. You wouldn't see the airway in this MRI. No. You wouldn't. You cannot say anything about the airway in this MRI. It's in the shadow. Yeah, it is in the shadow again. Mm -hmm. They're concentrating on the area of interest. You don't, you don't see anything beyond that. Okay. Usually... Uh, this is a growth that is slow. You're more concerned about the spinal cord than the airway. Mm. Okay. So last picture. Here, you see lots of artifacts. It's become really less uh, reliable. I don't even know if this is pre or post surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I'm kind of interested, I get a myelogram. That's why myelogram is my favorite picture because you see the bone. You see, again, physics of it. Um, a regular MRI, the grid is 256, 256. A regular MRI, a CAT scan is 512, 512. So uh, actually the resolution is four times, mm -hmm. not two twice big, but because four times. squared. Yeah, because it's squared. Yeah. So if in question, get a myelogram. 
I have another meeting and to, uh, talking to another surgeon. So we have to quit here. Maybe time for one question, maybe. Maybe. I, uh, A short one. Go. Well, there was one question. Go. Um, my brother Nader asks, how did that patient present to you? Um, Which one? What were the symptoms, or the previous are, patient? This one? This one. How, are their, how was their Myelopathy. Present? Myelopathy. How severe was it? Very severe. Very severe. Mm -hmm. C2 through C7 myelopathy. We yeah. Look that up. Yeah, it is. <laughs> homework. That is, that, is, that, is, that is a massive problem, okay? And then the patient, um, one more slide before this, the one that had the reversal of the cervical, was this also myelopathy? How did this no, present? No, this is, this is just a cervical uh, axial pain and radiculopathy. No myelopathy, no, uh, you know, uh, it, it, practically, uh, this is very, very different from a myelopathic picture. Mm. Okay, well, let's call it now. It is five o'clock. I have another meeting going on. And uh, thank you for everybody. Let's uh, first stop sharing. And, thank you so much. Uh, we will make all this available for everybody, yeah. okay? Thank we you. learned a lot.